Everything has its season and everything has its time. Right now, it's harvest time in wine country. But grapes aren't the only thing that end up in your glass. There are plenty of ways to drink delicious. I'm traveling from wine country in Northern California to Normandy, France, and then to tequila in Mexico before going back home again to discover liquid treasures. 100 Days Drinks, Dishes, and Destinations is brought to you by... With AMA Waterways, guests can climb, pedal, and journey beyond the beaten path while cruising on storied rivers across Europe. You can find out more at amawaterways.com. When I picture my dad, Josh, I remember his hands. Strong, they were worn, stained. That was years of hard work as a lumberjack. His commitment, work ethic, values, that's what really inspired me to create Josh Sellers. Otherworldly and down to earth. Visit Napa Valley. Come with me to stamp your passport to delicious. I'm drinks and culinary expert, Leslie Sabraco. And I'm traveling, tasting, sipping, and savoring the world to share my bucket list of palate-pleasing experiences. On 100 Days, drinks, dishes, and destinations. Most of what lands on our plate comes from right here, the important part, the soil, the dirt, the place where things are grown. Apples grow in temperate climates around the world. And near my home in Sonoma County, California, I can pick apples fresh from the tree in fall. In Normandy, France, where apple orchards dot the landscape, eating and drinking apples is a way of life. I'm visiting my sister who lives in the heart of the Norman countryside, where she grows her own apples. And just around the corner is a farmer, Stefan, who crushes them, along with apples from neighbors and friends' harvests, to make juice, cider, and more. He told me to go pick up apples, and I found this. A tool. <laughs> It's almost like a little vacuum cleaner. Avoid the bad ones. Within moments, I've done my job. Okay. C'est des pommes à couteau. Un pommes à couteau. Donc, eating apples. Yeah, 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 eating apples. Deux types de pommes pour qu'on puisse avoir un bon jus de pomme. Oh, to make apple juice. Okay. Okay. So they have to be sweet enough to eat in order to make really good apple juice? You have to have sweetness okay, yeah, and acidity. Okay, I see two apples over here that I want to take a bite of and taste. Let's go. Mmm. It's crunchy, sweet, a little bitter, and super high acid. Bon, on va le mettre dans la corbeille. Alors là, on les a mis, on va les écraser. OK. OK. Allez, go. Faut tourner, on va les écraser. Non, 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 non. Uh, attends, et puis... Uh... On les met dedans. Ouais. Une fois, on va récupérer le jus. Et après, on va le mettre dans le petit tonneau. Maintenant, il faut, faut tenir les bras. Like et et on va moderniser, on a modernisé l'activité, parce que c'est quand même un ancien euh, métier. Ouais. Et c'est beaucoup plus facile. Come on. Tu nous montres? Venez. Allez, modern venez. Way. Stefan makes a lot of juice by first washing the apples in cold water. Then they're lifted on the conveyor belt into the crusher where the juice is extracted into a tank below. The remaining crushed pulp is saved and fed to the pigs. Once the freshly squeezed juice is pasteurized and cooled, it's packaged by hand one by one. This apple juice is just the first step when producing cider. The juice that's not packaged is allowed to ferment to a drink that clocks in at around 4 to 6 percent alcohol, essentially the same as beer. To make a spirit, cider is distilled into a clear eau de vie. It can then be aged in barrels for apple brandy or Calvados. Stefan's family has been distilling for the local community for decades. In fact, in times past, his grandfather would travel from village to village with a mobile still. Now Stefan distills each batch right here on the farm, and not just apples, everything from pears to plums to berries. But the famed spirit of the area is the apple-based spirit Calvados, 
and there are strict regulations around using the name Calvados on a bottle. Primarily, it must hail from the Calvados region of Normandy in France and use some of the 200 approved apple varieties. It's one of the most delicious and unique spirits I know, and finding a store in the town of Enfleur selling some very old bottles was like finding a treasure. So to be called a Calvados, you have to, of course, have be from, from the area, mm -hmm. um, including the Pédoge. Yes. Right? And you have to be double distilled or single distilled. In the Pédoge, you have to do double distillation to have the appellation Pédoge. It's the first appellation we have in 1942. The minimum for Calvados and Calvados Pédoge, it's two years old mm -hmm. in oak barrels. And uh, for Don Fronté, it's three years old. When we distill the cider, mm -hmm. we have 70% and the white alcohol. Mm -hmm. Then we put in the barrels and less alcohol with time. Right. With the evaporation, we call mm -hmm. it. Angel share. Exactly. Let's try a special one. So 40 years old. Yes, it's, it's richer. And it's why it's my favorite. <laughs> that warms me to my toes. Thank you very so, much. Santé. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. After this lesson, I took some back to Lisa's house for a dinner and liquid apple pairing. It's the perfect light and bright sort of Calvados to pour over the sherbet. I leave the French countryside for the mountains of central Mexico, where a small town in the state of Jalisco gives rise to a legendary spirit, tequila. The surrounding landscape is a stunning contrast of rugged volcanic mountains and vast, vibrant blue-green fields of agave. To uncover the mysteries of one of my beloved spirits, I'm visiting two producers, Pepe at the traditional and charming Casa Noble to follow the distilling process, and Ileana at the modern and chic Tres Agaves. She shares a story about how tequila, a type of mezcal, came by its fame. What we are looking in here is the blue agave. We all call them mezcal because that is the native uh, word for this plant. Back then, when they started to produce this beverage, they used to call it mezcali. And when the Spanish arrived, they saw it was really similar to the wine. So they named it wine mezcal. When they arrive to another places of Mexico, they start asking, hey, where is this from? And they say, from tequila. Oh, can you bring me some wine mezcal from tequila? So at some point they start calling, hey, can you bring me more from tequila? But I like from tequila. So they erase the part of wine mezcal and they just start calling that tequila. And so developed the name tequila. But it takes time and commitment to make this spirit Oh, stop it. You're going to have your little one of a baby, so you, we can <laughs> take care of it for you. I have my own agave plant. What do you want? Which the one biggest? do I want? This one, mm. this one, this one? Actually, I want this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great eye. I saw a bigger one. I'm going for the big one. Let me hold from here. Yes. And then just... She will be ready in seven in years. In seven years. <laughs> Today, all tequila is made from the Blue Weber variety of agave. In the fields, the space between rows is kept wide for the jimadores, or harvesters, to pass through. These are extremely dangerous and sharp. <laughs> they are. Well, it, it's like a needle. It was back then, on the pre Spanish times, they used to use these like needles. So what is the age of this row? This Thank row you. is exactly two, almost three years old. Three years old? Yeah. What about some of the larger ones back there? It is the same. I same. mean, it, it is just like, like you and me. It's like someone gets taller, someone mm. gets the sweetness. Guess who's the taller one? <laughs> I know, but I, I have the sweetness. <laughs> Harvesting agave and making tequila is highly regulated, and they don't make it every day, so I'm really lucky to be visiting Casa Noble as they're in production. A very interesting thing of agave versus other spirits is that you have to wait all this time to harvest the agave. So at least six, seven years, but up to 10, 12 years. Right. And that's quite an investment to have to do that. And then you rip out the whole plant. It's not like a vine where you plant it once and then you harvest the grapes. 
you have to take the plant out, right? You do. Mm -hmm. So we actually pour plant, we kill it, uh, but it gives us the beautiful tequila. Yeah, it's got a better life in the bottle. <laughs> we have Quirino here. Hola, uh, Quirino. Quirino is 120 years old. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah. That is called the coa, which is a traditional tool of a gimador. So that is the triangulo, so you sharpen the tool because it's going to be very sharp. He actually cut some of the uh, pencas. Just the sound of it. Oh, look at that. He's already doing it. The gimador digs up the plant, and it's not easy. He then cuts off all of the leaves to expose the piña, or heart, of the plant. So a jimador will do around 150 in a day. And 150 of those a day. Is it my turn? It's okay. your turn. Okay. So here and here. Okay. And you can see how sharp it is. It just goes through it. Yeah, this is if an anger management, man. Woo! Each piña can weigh anywhere from 80 to 200 pounds, so it takes some serious muscle to carry them. And these guys work all day in the heat from the horno, or ovens, stacking them more than six feet high for long, slow roasting. This roasting develops the sugars and brings out the plant's sweetness. So in here, we can- I got to taste the cooked piña with Ileana. It tastes like a piece of candy. Yes, exactly. There and really some, some people say it tastes like a pumpkin, mm -hmm. something like that. It's, it's like a pumpkin, but it's sweeter. The roasted piñas are then shredded and crushed, extracting the sweet sugary juice. Mostly done by machine now, the traditional way to extract the juice actually crushes the piñas with a giant stone wheel called a tahona. You can still find this method in use today. The juice, along with the yeast, is transferred into tanks to ferment into a low-alcohol beer-like mosto. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now we're getting some alcohol. Once fermentation is complete, it's time for distillation to uncover the pure aroma and flavor of the agave. To achieve this, the mosto is heated and condensed multiple times until what's left is the pure heart of the spirit. <laughs> because I'd be like a dragon. Tequila must be distilled twice, but here at Casa Noble, it's distilled three times for purity and smoothness. There are five types of tequila, but we're focusing on the main three, and I'm going to taste them with Eliana. So we have the three classes. We have Blanco, Reposado, and Añejo, and we can see the difference between them in color, in smell, and taste. So we always start with the Blanco because it's the purest. This one has just a mouth-filling texture. Yes. It sort of well wraps, you, wraps you in comfort. Blanco, reposado. Reposado, and that is rested, right? Exactly. Tell me about the, the aging requirements for a reposado. Well, it has to be by law at least two months on, uh, on the barrel that you may want. And we keep this nine months. You get just a whisper of sweetness. There's spiciness, there's a hint of vanilla on this, but it, it really is a, um, a balance between an, an aged Añejo and a Blanco, isn't it? Our third glass is Añejo. So this has one year and two months in the barrels, and we see that the color is a little bit darker. It is gold still, uh, but the flavor is going to be stronger. It's, it's rich, it's powerful, <laughs> yes. yes. It's, it's, you know, it's like you, it's powerful. <laughs> Salud. Salud. Tequila goes into margaritas, of course, but there are other delicious tequila cocktails and they work so well paired with food. At Allium Restaurant in Guadalajara, the amazing inventive menu is served family style and paired perfectly with a variety of agave-based cocktails. Gracias, chef. Back in Sonoma and Napa in Northern California's wine country, hey, you can drink it whenever. it's time to enjoy one of life's most pleasurable beverages, wine. That is an elegant rosé. There are thousands of acres planted to vines in this region. The climate and the sunshine and the soils make for a grape-growing haven. And it's not just people who indulge in the bounty of the vines. There are lots of critters that feast on the fruit, too. 
And to keep them in check, sustainable vineyards, such as those at Bouchain, use a natural method employing birds of prey to rid the land of pests. During harvest, the, the birds love to eat the grapes like we oh all do. Gosh, that... When they're sweet and they're ripe, it, they can strip a vineyard very quickly. Very quickly. So shooing them away on a daily basis becomes really critical for us. Birds definitely in their DNA have this just terrifying fear of any predator like right. a falcon or a hawk. And so when Rebecca releases her hawk, they just rise up and off they go. And honestly, after a while, they get used to the sound of her truck. And all she has to do is drive by and they just lift up and, and go out to the water. <gasps> Look at him just sitting in the car. Yep. Hey, Come on, baby. sweetie. You ready to work? And who's the owl? That is, okay, he's uh, Lord Nibbler Weston Ghibli, AKA Bubbles. <laughs> That's his Instagram, <laughs> AKA Bubbles. We couldn't AKA decide Bubbles. on a name, so he ended up with all of them. He's, he's, made, he's doing a dance for us this morning. <laughs> so tell me what kind of falcon this is. Uh, he's a Barbary Saker falcon, which is a hybrid um, between a Barbary falcon and a Saker falcon. So a mutt falcon. <laughs> <laughs> the best kind. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what's gonna be his job today? Um, he is going to fly around us and we're going to play a game called Keep Away with a Lure, um, which simulates what a wild falcon would do um, so that the birds believe he is a hungry hunting falcon. Ah, oh, there we go. Yep, yep, yep. Come on. There he goes. <laughs> there he goes. It's satisfying knowing that airborne raptors protect the grapes, and now we're going to pick them. These guys are the full-time crew at Dutton Ranch Vineyards. They started picking in the dark when the fruit is cold. They work with the vines all year long and know every inch of these plants. So they're the first to spot any problems. They're fast too, picking around 200 pounds of grapes an hour. <laughs> That's a lot. My friend James, winemaker at The Calling, is showing me the ropes. So on the morning side, they open up the canopy a little bit more, so the fruit's a little bit more exposed with the morning sun coming up. And then in the afternoon, you get a little bit more, little bit more leaf coverage because obviously it's a little bit hotter. So we call this moon dust soil. So this is classified as a gold ridge sandy loam. It's very well draining. And as you can see, it's very fine. And so this is a three to five million year old ocean floor. And uh, just about three feet down from the surface, there's a there's pure strata of seashells, fossilized seashells. Grapevines love this type of soil because it drains well, doesn't retain much moisture, and the roots of the grapevine like that. From the vineyard, the Chardonnay grapes are dumped and lifted into an enormous bladder press, an apt name for a machine that squeezes all of the juice from the fruit. To make white wine, only the juice is transferred to the tanks or barrels where fermentation takes place. But if we were making red wine, the juice and the skins of the red grapes would be in the fermentation tank together, as it's this contact that gives red wine its color. You, this is when you need smell of vision because when you walk into a winery that has fermenting tanks, there is just this smell of yeast and of fruit and of baked bread and look at this. This has been fermenting for about 14 days now. Tomorrow night, we're gonna drain it and then press it on Saturday. So this is called the cap and it's this big thick layer of skins that sort of rises to the top and underneath is the juice. There it is. Okay, that's yep. about a, a foot thick, yep. foot and a half. And it's still warm. Yep. And, as you can and so see, heat is another byproduct of fermentation is heat and CO2. And uh, this is where red wine gets its color, right here, by soaking with the skins. But now, back to Chardonnay, which is resting in French oak barrels where fermentation continues. You can even hear it working. So this is fermenting Chardonnay in barrel. I take, I want you all to hear what this sounds like. Here's my microphone. We're gonna put it in. Tell me if you hear it, Peter. We can pull a little juice out. So when did these go um, into barrel? About a week ago. It's only about 80% full. We need to keep some headspace because the act of fermentation creates a lot of um, foam in the barrel. As Leslie put the microphone down in there and you could hear the, the uh, fermentation, 
this has started fermentation, so it's it's roaring in there. It's uh, sizzling and popping, and, and primary fermentation is taking place. So this is still juice phase, converting the sugars to ethanol. Yeast foam right Yeast there. Yeast foam. Mm. It still tastes a little bit like, almost like apple juice. It does, I was gonna say, you know like, what, it uh, tastes like apples. Yep. It really does. Yep. Mm. Very sweet. Oh, that's good. Yeah, is that good? It tastes just like yep. apple juice. Yep. So mm. ways to go. I'm gonna drink it all. Mm -hmm. The juice remains in the barrel for months, gaining complexity before it's bottled. Wine is such an important part of my life, and being a Midwest girl living in Northern California. Hey, chef, how Welcome. are you? There's nothing I enjoy more than eating at a meat lover's mecca, sipping world-class Cabernet Sauvignon to accompany a perfectly cooked steak. And in this case, not just any steak, but well-aged. I mean, very well-aged. It's like a museum or it a library like, of beef. It is like sheer heaven. I'm a steak loving. My nickname as a kid was Tyrannosaurus Rex. Oh, I love so, that. I love so, to that. me, appreciating a great piece of beef is one of the pleasures of life. I'm thrilled to I be here. I get my perfect customer. <laughs> That's you know? me. This is one of the you know old school styles of preserving beef, not only just for flavor, uh, also at a necessity, but for tenderization. Mm -hmm. And what I found, particularly um, in the beef that I procure is really just varying the ages to get different nuances, different flavors. The quality of the of the meat clearly is something that, that it starts start there. With. It starts right. there. You know, for me I've been buying from the same guy for the past fifteen years. This stuff just really came in this week. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I mean, you know, you're looking at very, very fresh beef, but what I want you to see is the intense marbleization that's happening mm -hmm. in here. But this is a great example of some great cattle right here. Yeah. So this is like, it's hard as a rock. And it, it really is. It it's a protective look, case around it, Exactly. Isn't it? It's almost like case arne. And this uh -huh. doesn't look very attractive. No, it does not. But when we flip it around and you see what's inside, and this is just about 85 that days. That is attractive. I mean, it that is, is beautiful. So we have three steaks here. You can see three different sizes here. Literally 84 days, this is aged. Ah, okay, this, this is, is 134 aged. days aged. This is 525. Stop it. This yeah. is it has been aged 525 yeah, days. Absolutely. So it would have started out the same size as here. Just about. So I'm so, going to get to taste the difference yeah, between Yeah, we're going to taste. We're going to go one, two, three. We're going to taste them side by side together. We'll get to taste it. The excitement is real. <laughs> I'm hungry and I cannot wait to try this. Should I give you your plate? All right. Okay. Let's go. Thank you. This is the 90s. So most people, when they come in, this is what they would order, correct? Yeah, but I, so I do offer an extended age mm -hmm. steak, so. Mm. The flavor is hearty and mm. there's a, a beautiful rusticity to it. Mm. So, okay, we're going now to the next Aging, so we've, we're aging um, a another third fifty longer. days. Yeah, another, a third longer. Mm, there's a sweetness, especially around the edges of the of the steak. Absolutely. Well, you're going to be really surprised because I had to jump ahead. Did you? And eat the five hundred because okay. this is so sweet. Mm. The flavor is sweet, but it's also just savory mm -hmm. and earthy and smooth. There's such yeah. a smoothness to it. Yeah, definitely. And you'll I find wouldn't, if I had my eyes closed, I don't know that I would say that. It's beef. Is even beef. Yeah. And I actually brought two wines oh, to share. I can't wait. To try because we were trying younger and, yeah. and aged yeah. more, a little older. I brought one of what Thank I consider you. the world's best wines. Thank you. From Schaefer, iconic. Napa Valley Cabernet Fantastic. Sauvignon producer. And so this is the 2008 in your left glass. Okay. So a little more age, a little more intensity, concentration, opening wow. up, giving you all these aromas and flavors. And then a little baby next to it, the 2013. <laughs> to me, this is one of the world's most perfect pairings. Yeah, I agree. Dirt makes a difference. And I mean that in the best sense of the words because it's about a term in wine we call terroir. 
which has a relationship to everything that appears on a dinner table. It's the experience of tasting the place in the glass, of tasting the respect of, of the person who crafted and created what is on your dinner plate. And that's what brings such joy to the experience of eating and drinking. Here's to deliciousness. 100 Days Drinks, Dishes, and Destinations is brought to you by... With AMA Waterways, guests can climb, pedal, and journey beyond the beaten path while cruising on storied rivers across Europe. You can find out more at amawaterways.com. When I picture my dad, Josh, I remember his hands. Strong, they were worn, stained. That was years of hard work as a lumberjack. His commitment, work ethic, values, that's what really inspired me to create Josh Sellers. Otherworldly and down to earth. Visit Napa Valley. For more information on all episodes, along with our expanded digital series, including behind the scenes footage and stories, and links to follow me on Facebook and Instagram, go to 100 Days Drinks Dishes Destinations.com. And this is a different falcon. Yeah, this is a peregrine falcon. Oh, he wants to fly. Oh, he's going to get a bird. Look at him, scaring that bird away. And the dance begins. Oh, no, that's a wild falcon giving him a oh, hard time. Oh, really? Yeah. He can take it. That's a, he's chasing him. Oh, my God. <laughs> Two falcons walk into a vineyard. Yeah. No.